The 1980s was the decade that revolutionized superbike racing. Superbikes started at the end of the 60s, start of the 70s with high barred naked bikes, eventually moving to the full fed bikes that we see today. Now, when you're thinking 1980s, you probably think bikes like Suzuki's GSXR 750, maybe Kawasaki's ZXR 750, but really in the 1980s, there was one Japanese bike that was the absolute benchmark. And we've got one here. This is the Honda RC30. The RC30 is a prime example of what Honda does from time to time. Create something with a single purpose in mind and spend no expense in doing so. In this case, that purpose was to win the inaugural World Superbike Championship in 1988 with Fred Merkel at the helm, who backed it up a year later in 1989 for a second title. Curiously, the V4 Honda Concert was not exactly covered in glory by the time the RC30 broke cover. The V4 had its origins in the ill-fated NR500-500cc project of 1979 and 1980, and in 1982 along came the VF750S, then the VF750F, also known here in the USA as the Interceptor. This is when a new set of regulations for superbike racing capped the capacity at 750cc. After that came the VF1100C and then the VF400F, the latter designed to snatch some of the market held by Yamaha's liquid-cooled RD two-stroke series. The 400 was soon joined by the VF500F, which quickly gained a reputation as the best of all the V4s so far. At the other end of the scale came the new VF1000F, and for the sporty set, the VF1000R with gear-driven overhead camshafts. Unfortunately, the VF1000R really missed the mark, being too heavy, enormous in appearance with less than adequate suspension, especially when in view of the incredible capabilities of the 122 horsepower engine. By 1984, Honda was beginning to take serious interest in endurance racing and thus came the RS750R, which was based on the VF750F used in AMA Superbike Racing. The endurance racer developed into the RVF750 with 135 horsepower on tap and with Wayne Gardner in the saddle bought Honda the cherished victory in the Suzuka 8 hours in 1985 plus the top spot in the World Endurance Championship. Honda was winning on the racetrack but sales of the road going V4s were sluggish. In an effort to gain some reflective glory from the championship wins, the VFR750F was created, which eventually led into the VF750R, or what we now know as the RC30. While the RC30 was technically based on the latest evolution of the VFR750F, the resemblance was superficial, and the attention to detail reflecting the fact that every RC30 was built by a small team of dedicated technicians at the Honda Racing Corporation. Beginning with the power plant, the major difference was the reversion to a 360 degree throw for the crankshaft, upon which sat titanium conrods, the exotic material also used for the valves. Camshafts ran in needle roller and roller bearings, acting directly on the valve stems, the elimination of rocker arms allowing for a more compact cylinder head casting and for the inlet ports to be realigned by tilting six degrees higher to produce a more direct path from the carburetors to the combustion chambers. The standard 38 degree included angle for the valves was retained, no oil cooler was fitted, but oil temperature was reduced by running engine coolant through a small circular radiator mounted adjacent to the oil filter. Two large radiators, one with fan assistance, carried the engine coolant. Chassis-wise, the RC30 was closely based on the aluminum twin spar RVF750 with what Honda called the diamond frame concept which used the engine unit as a stress member. The RVF had made good use of the ELF patented single sided swing arm. Honda paid royalties to the French fuel company for each item produced, with the wheel retained by a single nut which allowed for rapid wheel changes where the rear sprocket and chain remain in place. The RC30 employed an 18 inch rear with a 5.5 inch rim, supposedly as it offered marginally better wearing qualities, which was another crucial factor in endurance racing. The rear brake setup incorporates a linkage connecting the caliper to the chassis, claimed to reduce squat under braking and acceleration. Up front, the provision for rapid wheel changes was also evident. Each fork slider actually swivels inside the mudguard mount to allow the calipers to clear for easy servicing while a single nut on the bottom of each slider operates a hinge that allows for the wheel to simply drop out. 
A shapely aluminum fuel tank with a quick fill cap was used and each fiberglass fairing was hand laid and finished. For 1987, a batch of 1,000 RC30s was produced for the Japanese market, but these were severely detuned, producing around 77 horsepower, with small diameter headlights and black mirrors. This production completed the required homologation for the 1988 Superbike World Championship. When the RC30 went on sale in the UK in 1988, it was listed at a staggering 8,495 pounds, while American Honda asked for and received $14,998, which is around 35 grand in today's money. In all, 4,885 editions were created for international customers between 1987 and 1992, and we've got one here right now. Well, here we are. On an RC30, long at last. It's taken me 15 years to get my bum on one of these things. Uh, I started doing this job back in the mid 2000s, and I've always wanted to ride one. I managed to tick off the RC45 a few years ago, and that was great. But I've got to say, I like the RC30 more. <laughs> this is the this is the granddaddy of modern Honda superbikes in a way. Um, you know, this was the first motorcycle, first production motorcycle that was developed by HRC, by the Honda Racing Corporation. This bike was designed basically to win the World Superbike Championship, which it did the first two years. Uh, in fact, the only time that RC45, or RC30, I beg your pardon, has won the World Championship on it, both times with American Fred Merkel. Ah, oh, I just love this sort of stuff. i got to say, for a production bike, and a 30-year-old production bike, this is a 1990 model, it is astounding how good this thing still is. I could have changed lines at any point in that corner. It's very soft, like it's got standard suspension, but it just hugs the road, and I can just change lines on the whim. It's so stable yet so flickable. And it's just such a sweet bike. Far out. That's one of those great things that like you realize how good Honda got this thing. That it's still good today. And aside from the fact that values on these things have absolutely skyrocketed it. I think last year was well, last year or the year before it sold for over 100k for one of these things uh, at the Vegas auction. Quite incredible. But I hadn't ridden one at that point, so I didn't really know whether it was worth it or not. It still probably is a little rich. But the experience that this bike gives off is so different to a modern bike. You know, the, and that's probably worth a few bucks in itself. It's very low to the ground. Uh, the bars are quite a sort of uh, ne uh, steep uh, incline, I guess, you know, like they've curved in a fair bit. Um, I am probably about half a foot too tall for this thing. I must look ridiculous riding it. Uh, you, know, you would need to be the size of Joey Dunlop and his lop and all the greats that made, these th made this bike what it was to really fit on it. But compared to a modern superbike, I mean, a modern superbike is violent in comparison to the RC30. The RC30 is your friend. It just loves just cruising through these sweeping bends that we've got here in SoCal. This is also a bike that never had any um, emissions regulations put on it which is great if you like smooth throttle responses. 38 mil carbs on this thing, k in carbs, which are so perfectly adjusted at the moment. It's like I'm pulling the bloody throttle cables individually myself. It's so lovely. There is absolutely zero snatch or any form of jerkiness in the throttle. It's just divinely smooth. And it leads you into this power delivery that's, that's not overly powerful. Like, I mean, I've got to be honest, I'm kind of used to modern power deliveries that are fast and violent. This is the exact opposite. But it still urges you to keep going. 
Yeah, it's like, yep, all right, come on, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. You just need to play play with the bike and let it let it guide the rider because it's so smooth and so friendly. These are the kind of roads the RC30 loves. Nice big sweeping roads. And as I say, it's quite soft, so you don't want to be too violent with it. Brake performance has definitely come a long way in 30 years, but it's not too bad. You know, for an old girl, it, it, it brakes pretty well. So at least, even though there's not a massive amount of power there, there is at least a lot of feel. So you know what's going on. I've had plenty of bikes that have lots of power, but absolutely zero braking feel. Thank you, sir. Uh, the gearbox action is absolutely one of the best gearboxes I've ever used. Modern bike, old bike, whatever. It's got no quick shifter, obviously, but it's supremely light. Light but positive, you know, it just goes click, click, click. You just know exactly what the bike's doing, and that's probably the biggest thing about this entire bike. Chassis, brakes, suspension, motor, throttle, whatever. You're just constantly aware of it. Nothing is fettered by electronics. There's none of that feeling that, like, that you're not the one in control. Like you're, you are the one that has to, in you're in charge of your own destiny on an RC30. It's not the computer telling you no. It's not the, you know, the lean angle sensitive traction control telling you what you can and can't have. This is a, a motorcycle in its purest form and absolutely a motorcycle in one of its best forms. I mean, there's, there's bikes throughout the years, RC30, the Ducati 916, Yamaha R1, you know, bikes that reinvented the game and it shows what a great decade that was, the 1990s, for superbike technology. Now it's it's moving on again, you know, let's be fair, it's definitely moving on again. It's now just a power, it's a power race mixed with you know, the, the um, development of lightweight materials and electronics and all that stuff but this was just a mechanical masterpiece this an absolute joy to ride and i just don't want this road to end i've had a good break with the cars too you can just bank this thing in and it just does exactly what i want it's got that 18 inch rear wheel on the back uh, which was designed for endurance racing. Uh, it just steers so quick. It really does make some modern bikes feel pretty piggish in comparison. Yeah, I don't think I can handle more than 45 minutes on board one of these things purely because the the legs are pretty cramped. <laughs> legs are pretty cramped and you're kind of stretched out a little bit on one of these. It's not about brushing the lights off this thing. It's just about enjoying the experience. But fantastic bike. Absolutely fantastic bike. Straight to the top of one of my favorite, kind of right up the very top of some of the favorite bikes I think I've ever ridden. It's great when you meet your heroes and they're not, uh, I say assholes, but like, <laughs> uh, it's great when you meet your heroes and they're as good as you think. Fantastic bike. Anyway guys and girls, I'm about to hit some road work, so I hope this has given you a bit of an insight into what the RC30 is like to ride. I'm smiling from ear to ear on this thing, I just can't get enough of it. But I'm going to have to give it back. Uh, thank you very much to John Seidel and all the guys at American Honda for organising this test. Uh, without them this wouldn't be possible. So anyway guys, uh, please give us a thumbs up, give us a, a comment, share, subscribe, do all that good stuff for us and we'll keep pumping out the content coming your way from Cycle News. Until next time, guys, I am Rennie Skaysbrook riding an RC30. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See ya.